Hey guys, welcome to the channel. My name is Jared. I've been getting a lot of DMs recently on Instagram about the C8 engine and there appears to be a lot of interest in it. And I've had a lot of questions about what can I do with this part? What can I do with that part? Um, does this work? Does this not work? And I thought I might do a bit of a two part series. This first part, just going over all of the parts on the C8 engine and their limitations. So everything from the block, the intake manifold, the exhaust, the turbo, injectors, fuel, ECU, all of that stuff. I just wanna go right from the top to the bottom through everything, just cause everyone has a different setup. Everyone wants to maybe use a stock cam or stock intake manifold or stock crank. And some people have new this and old that. So I just wanna go through every single part so you can see what things you want to reuse in your build, what things you can't use, and what things you think you're going to need to upgrade. So we'll, I'll just go through each part individually, explain the limitations and what sort of power you can actually get out of each part before you think you need to upgrade. So first we're going to start off with the crank. So mind you, this crank is a bit rusty. Um, it's just been sitting outside for a while. But the crank in the engine is actually one of the better parts um, that Nissan engineered. So the main points of this crank is that it's got five main caps um, holding it down. Probably the main limitation of the crank is it's a bit like the RB26 crank where they have this short nose or this snout that the oil pump actually drives on. It's got a flat on the top of the bottom, which doesn't have the most engagement or drive and the corners of this if you're not careful can actually turn off and the oil pump gear can spin on the crankshaft other issue with it is like in this case the front main seal groove wear which is more difficult to fix and also that the key is not particularly large and if you don't do the front bolt up properly the key can actually turn and damage the keyway so the cranks, I've seen people make anywhere between six and 700 horsepower on standard cranks, but pretty much at that power level, you're probably gonna start thinking about stroking the engine, going to a two or maybe a 2.1 liter crank. So I'd say the crank, something you could easily keep six, 700 horsepower, no worries. Moving on from that, probably in conjunction is this oil pump. So the oil pump is actually quite good. Um, like I just said before, its main limitation is that the drive in there, it's not a particularly large area and it's actually smaller in the oil pump than the snout on the crankshaft is. The other issue with the oil pump, just like the RBs, is the oil pump gears. So inside here you've got an inner and outer race and it's a gear oil pump. So if you have a lot of two-step, um, or anti-lag, those gears in there can shatter. From my research online, you can't buy aftermarket oil pump gears for these oil pumps. I'm not 100% sure whether RB26 oil pump gears can work in these pumps. One upgrade you can do with these oil pumps is you can take the relief out here and shim the oil pump to give you more pressure and flow. The other thing you can do is also inside here where the oil comes out into the engine, you can also port the passage to increase the flow. My recommendation with the oil pump is stick with the factory oil pump unless you're doing circuit racing and you might want to think about going dry sump, um, but recommend doing those upgrades, porting the oil pump, shimming the oil pump, and I would, if you're rebuilding the whole engine, just buy a new oil pump. You also might want to think about putting Vaseline or grease inside the oil pump before you first start it up. That's going to help prime the engine. And finally, I would stay away from anti-lag or two-step just so you don't shatter those factory gears. Moving on from there, we've got the rod and piston combo. So starting with the rod, it is a hardened rod. And you can see it's not the thinnest thing in the world, um, but it's not also as big as a forged rod. So the main limitation here is the actual rod itself bending um, on the down part or on the upstroke and also these factory rod bolts. The rod bolts aren't the strongest thing either. So I've seen both the rod bolt snap and also the rod bend. 
Normally the rod um, is a bit stronger than the piston. The piston in this case is a cast piece. It's not forged or hardened like the rod. Um, so it's not going to be as resistant to detonation as a forged piston. So the main risks here are detonation or melting the piston or actually cracking the piston or cracking a ring land where the ring seats and getting excess blow by. So the limitation with the rod, I would say about 450 Newton meters would be a limit for both the main bolts, the main cap bolts and also the rod. And the piston I would probably put around in the same realm, if not maybe it's gonna be slightly weaker. Next part we're gonna talk about is the engine block, the heart of the engine. So the engine block, if you didn't know by now, it's made of cast iron, which is probably its biggest benefit over the SR. It is a lot more resilient to cracking. The CA unfortunately has the same issues as the RB and the casting is a bit hit and miss. So the major limitation in these is actually the cylinder wall thickness between the cylinders. If you were gonna build a large horsepower engine, you would probably wanna get the block crack tested and hardness tested and also see how thick the cylinder walls are because you might wanna offset bore the engine. Unfortunately, at this stage, there is no upgrade for the block. So you can't buy a billet block and they don't make braces for these engines. But generally because the piston and rod set up a square, there's less torque on the engine. So these engines can actually rev higher than the SR because they have a shorter stroke. Um, so the harmonics in the engine are actually quite good. One little upgrade you can do is port the oil return here to help reduce the amount of oil filling up in the head and return it to the sump. So moving on from the block up to the head, the next part we have is the head gasket. So what I have here is a Kometic multi-layer steel gasket. So this is recommended upgrade for anyone building their engines. So the issue with the factory head gasket is it is made from like a fibrous material. So over age, it can deteriorate and it can also lift and release combustion pressure. So going with a multi-layer steel gasket, it's a lot harder for those combustion gases to actually escape. But if you are gonna go multi-layer steel gasket, you need to deck your head and your block and have a very clean surface so this does not seal. You can also buy different thickness gaskets depending on the compression ratio. So if you wanna get a thinner gasket, you can actually bump the compression up a little bit. The next thing holding that head gasket down is the head studs. Fortunately, I don't have the factory head bolts, but on the factory Nissan engine, they use a head bolt, not a head stud. So the factory head bolts aren't as hard and steel as upgraded like ARP head studs. So they are more subject to stretching. So when the factory head bolts stretch, the head can actually lift off the head gasket and the block and combustion gases escape, which is not great because then you're losing cylinder pressure and losing power. Cylinder pressures can go into the cooling system or into the oil system and create issues. These are factory rod bearings. So issue with the CA is that generally the last two cylinders, the third and fourth cylinder, the furthest from the oil pump can have issues with low oil pressure or excessive main and rod bearing wear. So when I bought my car, it actually had um, a bottom end knock. So as you can see here, this is a worn rod bearing. See, it's copper. This was in cylinder four, and this is a rod bearing that came from cylinder one and two. First upgrade you can do there is go get yourself some ACL bearings as an upgrade, because they're gonna be a lot stronger than the standard bearings. Second thing is you wanna make sure you have good oil pressure and good flow. So make sure you are running the correct weight oil. Your oil galleries aren't blocked. And if you can get an oil pressure gauge to check that you're running the right weight oil. Fortunately with 30 year old engines, um, they've done a lot of kilometers. You may already be buying an engine with excessive wear. 
and running more boost is just gonna accelerate the issue from occurring. Next, moving on to the cylinder head. So this is a factory CA18 DET cylinder head. So as you already know, we have cams that sit directly on top of the bucket with the hydraulic lifter. As you can see here, this is one of the buckets with the hydraulic lifter. Inside there is also a shim. So with the cylinder head, as you might know, there's actually two main designs, one with eight port and one with four port. So if your car's from Europe, you've got a, probably a four port. If it's from Japan, then you most likely got an eight port like you can see here. So it is a bit debatable which head is better, but I would probably suggest go with the head you've got. So the main limitation on the C8 engines is actually the amount of flow through the port there. So if you really wanna go high horsepower, I'd recommend you port the head. So I would recommend you port the intake ports and also the exhaust ports just to get a bit more flow. The next thing you wanna look at doing is upgrading the cams. So you can go two ways about this. You can either upgrade the duration or you can upgrade the lift. So the duration is one way to upgrade the power without having to upgrade your valve springs. Once you start getting into more lift, then you wanna look at upgrading the valve springs and you're probably gonna to need to then also reshim the hydraulic lifters as well to make sure there's right clearance. So in terms of the cams, their limitation, because they're only quite small, they're about 244, 246 duration cams, you're probably gonna to start to run out of torque at about six and a half, 7,000 RPM. If you wanna rev that car higher to eight and a half, 9,000, you're gonna need more camshaft. So I would say the limitation for these cams is six and a half, 7,000 RPM, and probably about 300 to 350 horsepower. You're really gonna to struggle to make any more horsepower than that. And probably the same 400 to 450 Newton meters of torque is gonna to be quite hard to achieve with a factory camshaft. Also, factory springs, they're not gonna let you rev past 8,000, 7,500 RPM. So you're gonna need upgrade of valve springs for that too. The more boost and the more flow you run through this head, the more heat it's gonna create as the head's quite restrictive. So I would say the cylinder head's probably good for 350, 400 horsepower before it starts to become a restriction. The factory cam gears may also be a limitation if you're looking to upgrade your camshaft as, as you get more duration. I would suggest that you dial in the cam to make sure the center line of the cam matches the engine to maximize your horsepower. These cams are actually quite good. They don't break, the teeth don't get damaged. So they are a lot better than a Chinese adjustable cam gear. If you are gonna upgrade to that, upgrade them, then I suggest you get some quality, buy some quality aftermarket ones. So next we're gonna move on to the intake manifold. So the intake manifold is actually split into two parts. You've got the plenum part, and you've also got the runner, the lower runner part with the butterfly valves. So starting at the front, throttle body opening is not the largest. Generally boosted cars don't require a large throttle body and the smaller the throttle body, the better response you're gonna get from the engine. So I would say throttle body is good, probably to 350 up to 400 horsepower. And then after that, you're probably gonna look at upgrading the size of it to something bigger. The factory intake manifold it's actually quite good. Because of the long runners, and this part included, it helps produce a lot of low end torque. And the manifold itself is not really a restriction to about 400 horsepower. The lower manifold part is probably the most debatable section of the intake manifold with the butterfly valves inside the manifold. A lot of people like to delete it to simplify the engine but the fact is that Nissan engineered these into the car and running them up until 400 horsepower is beneficial. So the main benefit you're gonna get from these butterfly valves is the low end torque improvement. They're not gonna affect horsepower until you're getting to about 400 horsepower. Then you wanna look at removing the rod out of here and actually welding up all of the sections inside the intake manifold. 
I would also recommend against deleting the vacuum tank and the solenoid valves in the system and just running it off vacuum pressure because you really wanna dial that in with the ECU to make it work correctly. The other part of the intake you will need to look at is the factory airflow meter. So looking at it from this end, it actually looks quite large, but when you turn it around, it's actually very small. This small opening in here is actually quite the restriction. Also, the resolution of these airflow meters is only good to about 160, 170 kilowatts then the signal becomes so distorted that the ECU just maxes out voltage and it just runs rich. So pretty much, if you want to run much more than a little bit of factory boost, you're going to need to upgrade the airflow meter. Like a lot of people like to go to the Z32 one, but it's 2022 and not a lot of people running airflow meters still. And you might want to think about going to a map sensor or even the R35 airflow meter is quite common these days. Also part of the intake, if you're still running a factory air blocks um, and you wanna make a bit more power, you might wanna upgrade that piping size and go to like a pod filter. After the intake, got the intercooler. So these intercoolers are pretty cool, like they're side mount from factory and they've got this little snout that goes into the front bumper to collect the air, but they're not very thick and they're not very large and they're not very efficient. They're good for a factory turbo and probably 12 PSI a boost, but if you've got the money, even at that point, going into a bigger front mount intercooler is gonna make you more power. It's gonna cool down the air and it's gonna help prevent detonation in your engine. It's gonna run a lot better. Intercoolers are so cheap these days, so I highly recommend get on eBay or your local parts store and get an upgraded front mount intercooler and piping kit as well. Next part of the engine is the exhaust manifold bolted on the side of the cylinder head. These manifolds aren't bad. They're actually quite reliable. The cast iron is very robust and it doesn't tend to crack that often, but it is very heavy. And as you can see here, this port is not very large. If you wanna to go to a bigger turbo, you wanna think about upgrading the exhaust manifold. When Nissan built the SR, the exhaust manifold on that is a lot better and a lot better flowing than the CA. If you do want to stick with the stock manifold, you can think about porting this out and even removing this center divider here to increase your flow. But if you're upgrading a turbo, it is 2022, maybe you want to get something with a V-band on it. That's tubular as well. This exhaust manifold is probably good. You're not going to see much flow restriction probably until 350 horsepower, even maybe 400 horsepower, but it is going to lose you some bottom end torque. The next, maybe the most important part for making the power is the turbo. Nissan put some pretty good turbos on their car. They will, they went with Garrett and I'm pretty sure they still go with Garrett today. And these turbos are pretty reliable for factory boost. The main issue with making more power with these turbos is the impeller. So these early T25 turbos, they actually had ceramic wheels. When you start running more than 12 or 14 PSI, the ceramic wheel, if it catches on the housing in here, can actually break off and damage the rest of the wheels and destroy the turbo. They also have quite small rear AR housings, which limit the flow of the engine. So I'd say these factory turbos are good for about 12 PSI, and you can get that with the factory wastegate actuator. They run seven PSI from factory. So you can go up to 14 PSI on a stock actuator. At that point, you're gonna to start to heat the air in the engine, and you could probably make 220, 240 horsepower with this turbo. But again, these are 30 year old turbos now, and they probably have a lot of shaft play. So turbos are really cheap now, even if you can't buy a genuine Garrett, there's a lot of really good China copies out there now, and it's something you might want to think about upgrading to. After the turbo, you got the dump. This isn't the factory dump pipe, but the factory dump pipe is cast and it's not very large. Something you want to think about upgrading is to like this, which is a bell mouth turbo dump pipe, and it goes to three inches. They also have a split pulse dump pipe, which has the, the internal wastegate piped separately to the main exhaust flow, which might have a divider inside to help separate the airflow between the two. It's debatable which one makes more power, but either way, upgrading to those is a very good upgrade. 
it's gonna help reduce a lot of exhaust back pressure. So next, moving on to the fuel system. So first thing we're gonna talk about is the injectors. So the injectors are top feed, which is good because there's a lot of options there to upgrade, unlike the side feeds on the SL, but they're not a large injector. I think from factory, they're only about 360 cc's, maybe 380 cc's injectors. So that right there is gonna limit you to running probably 250 horsepower before you run out of flow. Can buy some Nismo ones, or you can get some from a GTR um, as an upgrade, and they use the same plug and they'll, they'll go in. Next, we've got the factory fuel rail. Looks like this. This one's a bit bent, but factory fuel rail is actually pretty good. Looks ugly, but it's actually steel and it flows quite good. Probably the main limitation on the factory fuel rail is the fuel regulator at the end here. So the factory fuel regulator can actually do up to about 350, 400 horsepower before it just doesn't flow enough fuel. What you can do is if you wanna keep the factory fuel rail, you can actually undo these two screws at the back, buy a fitting and go to an external fuel pressure regulator. Other thing you might wanna think about is also the fuel hose size. So the factory fuel hose is seven and a half mil on the CA engines. And also if you've probably got an S13, because you're probably watching this because you've got a Sylvia, the factory fuel lines under the car are not that big. So the factory fuel line and the factory fuel hose is probably gonna cap you out at 450 horsepower, maybe 500 horsepower if you're really pushing the ragged edge. But at that point, you're probably gonna go ethanol anyway. So you're gonna to need to replace your fuel line with ethanol rated fuel hose. The last part of the system is also in the fuel tank, is the fuel pump. These fuel pumps, just like the rest of the car, are 30 years old. And if yours hasn't failed already, it's probably just about to fail. So you wanna look at upgrading your fuel pump. So at minimum, if you're gonna stay on pump 98 or unleaded fuel, not go ethanol, you probably wanna look at getting a Walbro 255 those pumps are gonna be good to 300 to 350 wheel horsepower. Just like on my CA, I'm running 300 horsepower and the fuel pump's just about capped out at that with the injectors I've got in it. They're a good fuel pump, they're reliable and they're cheap. And if you've got a factory pump, you should just go and replace it already. Also to note with the stock fuel pressure regulator, don't go put a Walbro 520 on the fuel pressure regulator. It cannot handle that much flow and pressure and you'll have problems with your fuel. With the stock fuel pressure regulator, you don't wanna go more than probably a Warbro 460 um, and that's probably pushing it at that level. Next, moving on to the electronics on the engine. So starting off with the ECU. ECU runs everything and just like the rest of the car, it's a 30 year old computer. No one uses 30 year old computers in the house anymore, unless you have very specific software you need to run. And these have also been stuck inside of a car going over a million bumps for 30 years. I personally had an issue with my car where it would just die and not start. And I replaced everything and it ended up being the ECU. The board on the ECU was cracked. And as you went over bumps, it actually broke connection and it would work and then not work and I couldn't find the issue. If you are absolutely adamant you wanna retain the factory ECU, you can do that. But if you wanna tune it, the next step up from there is a Nistune. So what is a Nistune? It's a daughter board that allows you to run an EE PROM, which is an, a programmable PROM on your ECU. The factory ECU is flashed once and cannot be flashed again. This allows you to continuously reflash new tunes on your ECU, and it also maintains a factory ECU, so it has its limitations. It's good for very mild upgrades, but again, if you think you wanna go probably more than 350, 400 horsepower, you probably wanna look at getting something newer that also allows you to run a map sensor, and also you're not running the risk of breaking or having a cracked board like I did in mine. Again, it's 2022, you got to upgrade with the times and there's so many ECUs out there and the price is really good. And just the quality from this to the old ECU is just not comparable. My car, I've gone with the Link. It's just absolutely, absolutely amazing. 
and you can chuck this into your factory case and it just looks like a stock ECU. I don't need to talk here for half an hour about why you should upgrade. You can look online yourself. But yes, 2022, the ECU runs your whole car. Just go out and buy a new ECU. The next major limitation of the CA engine, just like the RB, is the cam angle sensor. So the cam angle sensor is good for what it is and the age of its technology. So this drives on the edge end of the cam and turns around and tells the ECU the position of the engine for spark and fuel. The issue with the cam angle sensor is A, it's old and B, it doesn't have the best signal. So when you're getting into higher revs and you're running more boost, the signal that the ECU sees can actually vary slightly and can be distorted, which makes it more difficult to tune and inject fuel and spark at the right time. So what a lot of people do is then go to a crank trigger setup, which gives you a home and use this as a reference signal to tune the engine. This is actually gonna make you more power and is gonna make your car a lot more reliable. These are also extremely expensive now and even hard to get if you wanna replace them. You can also look at aftermarket options for replacing the the cam, the CAS cam angle sensor with something else as well. Next part in the ignition system is the igniter. So what this does, it's sort of translating the signal from the ECU to the coil packs. And this sits on the, the shock tower of the car. So if you're looking at upgrading your coil packs, you can either retain this or you can go to you can delete this and go to smart coils, which eliminate the need for the igniter. These are also really hard to buy new now these days. Um, they can be like four or $500 each. The next part of the ignition system is the spark plug. So this is an upgraded spark plug, but they come with a five heat range from factory. And if you don't know that when you go up in boost, you actually need to go up in heat range or step colder in your plug because more cylinder pressure means more cylinder heat. The other thing you can do with this spark plug is actually gap it down. If you're running 18 PSI or less, you can get away with a six heat range plug and probably gap it to about 25, 30 thou. Then if you wanna start getting up more than 300 horsepower, you're probably gonna look at getting a seven heat range plug, like a BKR7E, and you can gap that down to like even 20 thou if you're running boost pressures more than 18 PSI. The next part of the engine is the coil pack. So the coil pack is very debatable. I've seen people make different power um, with the same coil pack. Issue with the coil pack is that again, the 30 years old and they sit inside the engine under the spark plug cover or the coil pack cover, which holds a lot of heat in. Usually cause it's made of plastic and it sees all that heat, the stalk can actually crack and the, the spark can go through the stalk of the coil and you can actually get misfiring. But some people have had great success with the factory coils and they've made 300 kilowatts with them and other people are just running stock boost on their factory car and they've broken. So it's really lucky dip what you have, but there's so many different coils you can go with. Like I mentioned before, you can go with upgraded factory coils, sort of like a Spitfire, you can get R8, or you can go smart cores and go like Yaris or R35 and delete the igniter. It's totally up to you, but I would highly recommend replacing your 30 year old coil packs with something newer. Next part in the drive line is the clutch. So from factory, it's actually an organic plated clutch. It's sprung. These clutches in organic, uh, and as you can see, they have multiple springs on here. They're actually quite comfortable to drive and the cars come with very heavy flywheels. So the response in the engine with that heavy flywheel is not great. So if you want to get a bit more response, you can go with a lightweight flywheel, but please note that it's probably not going to be as good for drifting because you're going to lose a lot of engine inertia and it does make the car a bit harder to drive and a bit more chattery when you're taking off. You can also get harmonics in the drive line from upgrading to a lightweight flywheel. The organic clutch is great for up to about 400 newton meters or probably roughly like 250, 280 horsepower. Then this clutch is gonna to start to slip and you're probably just gonna glaze the surface of the clutch. 
At that point as well, this clutch disc is made to match the pressure of the factory pressure plate on the clutch. So again, this pressure plate is probably good for about 400 Newton meters of torque before it's not going to clamp that disc anymore and start to slip. There are some really cheap upgrade clutches. Like for example, I've had some really good success with extreme clutches. You can go up to like a five puck, a six puck, a three puck clutch with a ceramic material. And they've got a couple of different steps in pressure plate clamping force you can get. I've got the highest rated extreme pressure plate clutch in my car and I'm making 550 Newton meters of torque and it's not slipping but the limit on that is about 575 Newton meters. After that, if you're making more than 600 Newton meters of torque, you're probably gonna to need to go look at getting a twin disc clutch. Okay, so if you're still here in the video, the last part of the engine I'm gonna talk about is the gearbox. I don't have a gearbox with me, but the gearbox, just like the coil packs, you can either have a really good one or a really bad one after 30 years of abuse. The factory gearbox is good. It, they're actually quite small and light and they suit the engine really well. But the main issue with them is torque and horsepower. So just in general, I would say you're starting to push the limit of the factory gearbox about 230 kilowatts or 300, 350 horsepower. When you start making more than that, you're gonna start looking at breaking gears or make snapping input shafts, things like that. So if you wanna keep the factory gearbox alive and make it last as long as possible, don't do clutch kicks, don't do burnouts, don't go to the drag strip and don't do drifting and really baby that clutch when you're taking off. I'm not gonna stand here and talk for five minutes about upgrading to different gearboxes, but just so you know, that is a limitation of the CA gearbox. Going to the SR5 speed gearbox, I'm not sure if there's a much of a benefit there, but just so you know, you can use an SR5 speed gearbox on a CA as long as you swap the bell housing over. They do work. All right, guys, this is a bit of a long video today, but thank you very much for watching. Um, stay tuned for my next part in the series where I'm gonna talk about upgrading and options for upgrading each part of the engine. If you like this video, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. It really helps me out. I want to get to a thousand subs. Thanks for watching. See you later.